Uh, we are in our Hebrews series called The Ultimate Supremacy. And what we're really looking at is all of these arguments that our author makes that kind of put the puzzle pieces together of how Jesus is simply greater, how there is no one who is like him, and it doesn't matter what you compare him to, he is supreme over all in every way. And so this morning, we're going to dive into Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through the end of the chapter there, verse 19. But before we do that, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, just damage and hardship and pain and loss through the hurricanes that have happened. And so let's just take a moment to pray for those who have been impacted and affected by that, and then that the Lord would lead us through this passage. Let's commit this to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this morning and the time that we have to come before your throne. And we pray for those who have uh, been hit hard, who have lost loved ones, who have lost homes, who have lost... Uh, communities, really, that much of what they have known has been removed. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would be with them in this, that you would be reminding them of how you are in control and how you can lead them through. And we pray that for many, this would be a turning point, that they would cry out to you, that they would commit their life to you, and that they would enter into a faith relationship. We pray for those who are working on all of uh, the, the wreckage and trying to help restore what has been lost. We pray for safety and we pray for efficient work to be done. We pray for those who are trying to figure out where to live in the meantime, that you would guard them, that you would guide them, and that you would provide for them again and again. Lord, we pray that you would go before them in every respect. Lord, uh, as a church, we pray that you would draw us in before yourself, before your throne, as we enter into Hebrews 3, and that you would just speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, I want to ask that you just stand with me, and I'm going to read this passage, and we're going to stand out of respect for the Word of God. And if you have your Bibles, please read it along with me, otherwise it will be on the screen. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says... Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses, and with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of their unbelief. You may be seated. As we get into this, uh, we're going to move quickly. And I want you to start by noticing right off the bat in verse 7, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, that's present tense. It's not past tense. It's not that he said this a long time ago. What this reflects is that God's word is living and active. And because it's living and active, just as he spoke it to the people in the wilderness during Moses' day, it was true in the first century. And just as the Holy Spirit was saying it in the first century, he's saying it again today. This is meant for all Christians, all believers, in all times, in all places. The Holy Spirit speaks through the Word of God. 
and it is living and active, and we ought to pay close attention to what it says. And so what we find is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. So the question becomes, well, what is the Holy Spirit saying? He's quoting Psalm 95 here, and if you go and study Psalm 95, it's based on what happened in the wilderness in Numbers 14, where God called the people of Israel to move into Canaan and to start conquering the land, to start acquiring it for themselves. But they saw the size of the cities, they saw the size of the armies, they saw the size and strength of the people, and they thought, there's no way. It's better for us to go back to Egypt and to be slaves than it is to fight for our freedom. They they were unwilling to trust God. God called them. God prompted them. He led them to this place through the wilderness, and they rejected the call on his life, on their life. And so what we find is Psalm 95 reflects two very different postures before the Lord. The first one is the posture of Moses. And and listen to how this reads. This is Psalm 95, 1 to 7. It says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hands. As we read that, we we can see that it's an expression of worship. We can understand that this is someone who's in right standing with God, who's attributing to him the glory that he is owed and wants to live a life of worship before him. In, In a sense, we could think of this as those moments when you know that God is present with you when you know that the Lord has spoken to you directly and and there's nothing quite like it. And there's this sense of reverence. There's this sense of worship that we respond with. And so what we see is that this is what it means to find alignment with God. This is the type of peace that surpasses all understanding when we enter into a life that's committed to doing what God calls us to do, even if it's hard even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's not what we want to do, but we know it's right, so we will do it. And I'm not talking about checking all the boxes to make sure that we are just doing things right so that we can be righteous. I'm not saying that faith is meant that you have to perfectly uphold every little piece of the law. Rather, what we find is the role of the high priest, we talked about this last week in 3, 1 to 6, is to help people follow God's ways, not so that they can just do what God says, but to help posture their hearts for worship. The the doing of, of what his law says is not for the sake of doing it. It's not to prove that you're good enough to be a child of the king. It's not to earn your way into heaven in any regard. Instead, it's an expression of my commitment. It's an expression of my worship to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But now look at what Hebrew says in in verses 8 to 11, because he's quoting the end of Psalm 95. He, He chooses not to quote the first half. He assumes that we already know that. And really, we talked about that last week in verses 1 to 6. But now he's shifted, and he's making a comparison. Verses 8 through 11 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They, they have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." You see, here's here's the reality of what's happening. Moses is being compared to the people who are following Moses. The first half of Psalm 95 reflects those who found alignment and followed Moses as he followed the Lord. And then the second half represents everyone who said, no, we don't want to go into Canaan. 
We want to go back and be slaves in Egypt, that place where God freed us from slavery, the place where God brought the plagues and demonstrated his strength over and over again, when he saved us from the Egyptian army, when he parted the Red Sea. They, they saw God at work again and again, miracle after miracle, and they come to this place and they go, no, God can't do that. Let's go back. And we have those moments, too, where, where we feel prompted by the Holy Spirit, where, where we study Scripture and we know that the Lord is calling us to find alignment in a new way because we've been out of sync and out of alignment. Because we've been maybe drifting or falling into rhythms of complacency rather than having that expressive hunger, that expressive worship that seeks after him with all that we have. You see, as we look at this, what we find is the author is saying, look, there's really two ways to go. There's, there's really two ways for you to live your life. There are many who put their faith and trust in Jesus and they try to follow God while also holding on to everything in this life. They try to build their kingdom. They try to build their wealth. They try to build up everything they can, their status before other people. They care about all of these things and Jesus. And, and really the question that's being asked is, when will you recognize that all of these things that have been given to you are a blessing so that they can be used to worship Jesus? These are just a distraction. These will just pull you away if they are not submitted to the throne of God. And so we come back to verses 1 to 6 because we notice that Moses is mentioned as a servant within the house and that Jesus is Lord over the house. If you claim to be a Christian, what you're claiming is that Jesus is Lord over your life. And so the question becomes, how does your life reflect being submitted to him? Are you in a place where you're balancing, trying, trying to carry your Christian faith and also carry the things you want that are not of the Lord? Or are you in a place saying, no, no, everything in my life is in subjection to him and I'm going to follow him with all that I have? One of the things that stood out to me while Sri Raj was talking was that sometimes I think we get complacent in this sense. That, that we grow comfortable with the idea of, oh, I just need to learn more. I just need to grow personally. I need to cultivate my own soul more before I can share the gospel, before I can pray with my neighbor, before I can go out and be purposeful about moving God's kingdom forward. But the Great Commission is go therefore. And, and we know from the Greek as we study that it's not you need to leave wherever it is you live, but rather you need to go and tell the people who are around you. It's as you are going, share the gospel. As you are going, share what Christ has done in your life. As you are going, be intentional about praying over people and aiming to bless them because you've been blessed by God so that you can bless them. It's living on mission to purposely build the kingdom, to move the lines forward. But we grow complacent. We say, mm, that's not really for me because I need to grow my faith first. We make excuses about not entering into the call that God has for us because, ah, like, like the Israelites, we're not going to go there. I'd rather go back to Egypt. And, and I don't think we always think of it that way. We find ways to rationalize and to justify it. But if we were to study our past, if we were to study uh, the ways in which that we have purposely kind of rebelled against God, those moments where he has prompted you, he has called you, and maybe you responded in the moment and you said, Lord, I'm sorry, and, and you asked for forgiveness and you took off the weight that you were carrying and you laid it at his feet. But did you do anything to change your life going forward? Did you change habits? Did you start making spiritual investments that would lead you to a place of cultivating your faith more and more? Or is it that you were just content to take the weight off? That you were just content to stop and to say, oh, Lord, this is so good. This is so freeing. You've forgiven me. I'm in alignment with you for this moment. And you never actually change anything. And in three months, you're in the same place you were. You see, there's a warning in this passage. 
It's a warning of rejecting God's words. Which is an interesting warning because we see from the very beginning of Hebrews, long ago and many times in many places, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. God is still speaking today. He has spoken throughout history. He's still speaking today. He's calling us before his throne. He's calling us to grow, to mature, to cultivate our souls, and to live on mission for him, not to be complacent in our mission. Not to sit back and always make it about my growth, my development, or even my family. But rather, gearing my family before the Lord to go out and to do the work of the ministry. To go out and to build God's kingdom. This is the call of the Christian. So we can evaluate our past. We can identify ways we've done that. We could evaluate our present. And we could come to the place where we realize there are all kinds of habits in my life. Things that maybe are not terrible in and of themselves but they're distracting me from appropriate time with the Lord. They're distracting me from actually putting a step of faith out in following where God leads me. Even as we look into our future, we could think about the ways that God will continue to refine us if we find alignment with him and we're walking towards him rightly. There's still going to be ways that we fall short and that we are sinful. Martin Luther is the one who said the closer he grew in his relationship to the Lord, the more he realized how wicked he was. The reality is we're far more wicked than we would ever want to believe. And it's because of our pride that we are blinded by that reality. And so we, we come into this, and what we see in verse 10 is this phrase, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. We're, we're so content to just have these moments before God and to not have a life of consistent discipline where we bring ourselves back into alignment every day. About four or five years ago, there was a significant study done where they were trying to evaluate what, what is the impact of daily devotions and, and not in reading a devotional book, but in reading the Bible itself. What is the impact on a person when they are committed to reading the Bible? And they, they followed all kinds of people, and they tracked people who didn't read their Bible, but they went to church. They tracked people who read their Bible once a week, where they just set aside time to be with the Lord. They did it twice a week, three times a week, four times a week, every, every day of the week. And it was, it was interesting to see what happened, because the people who just came to church never changed. There was no real movement in how they lived their lives. They were just the same person they were 10 years ago. The people who read their Bible once a week, twice a week, three times a week, only had slight amounts of growth. They could only identify slight ways in which the Lord had moved them over the course of years. But anyone who broke that barrier of four, where they were spending more of their week with the Lord than not, Everyone who broke that barrier of four had significant movement in their life. Whether that be growing in their ability to resist temptation, whether that be their willingness and readiness to share the gospel, to get involved in ministry. There were all kinds of metrics that were shown in this study. And what we find is that when you spend time with God, When you seek after him with regularity on a daily basis, God moves. He cultivates you in a way that you cannot cultivate yourself. And so we have to think back to where we were even just a few weeks ago because the first warning of the book of Hebrews brought us to that question, do you really believe? And after that service, we had a whole bunch of people who came forward for prayer. People who said, I, w- I want to grow in my hunger. I want to grow in my expression of worship. I I've found myself being complacent, and I don't want to be in that place anymore. I want to move towards the Lord in a meaningful way. And then after the service, I interacted with several more people who had shared similar convictions. And later that week, I interacted with several more people who shared the same convictions. I believe three weeks ago, the Lord met with many of us in a very powerful way. But here's the sobering question. You were convicted. 
you, you were compelled, have you changed anything? Are you functioning any differently today because of the way that the Lord led you yesterday? It's a hard question when the answer is, no, I haven't. Take a look at verses 12 to 15. It says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Let's pause right there. Really what he's saying is, if you are unwilling to move towards God, what you're going to find is complacency in your heart. What you're going to find is an unbelief that is there that actually allows you to harden your heart against God so that when he calls you to move into Canaan like the Israelites, you might just kind of be like, nah, no thank you, I'd rather be in slavery over here. And that's the reality of our choice, right? Either we can live in freedom before God in alignment with him and build his kingdom, or we can live in slavery to our sin. Those are our two choices. And so, our author is aiming to actually encourage us in the midst of this warning. He's aiming to actually say, but look at this. Take a look at verse 13. But exhort one another every day. How often should we speak of the Lord to one another? Every day. As long as it's still called today. He's saying as long as there's still time, as long as you're still living, as long as another day comes, Go talk about the Lord with one another. Go be in his presence. Seek after him so that you do not be hardened. So that you do not give in to this temptation that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Here's the reality. Your sin is a master manipulator of your desire. It is a master manipulator. And it is, sin is so blinding it is maddening for the people around you to watch. When, when we fall into the depths of sin and we keep just one choice after another, rejecting what God is calling us to step into because it's uncomfortable, because it's hard, because it's beyond me, because I don't know, or what if, or I... And we come up with all kinds of excuses. Are we ready and willing to move towards the Lord? Are we serious about having accountability with one another, about letting people speak into my life, and when they speak into my life, to receive it and not reject it? Recognizing that the Lord sends people all the time. Verse 14. For we have come to share in Christ. If indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. He's repeating verse 6, which we covered last week. He's making sure that we don't miss it, that there is a significant evidence of the life of a genuine believer. A genuine believer will persevere to the end. A genuine believer will not allow their heart to get hardened, but they will come back and find alignment as often as they need, whether that be minute by minute or day by day or hour by hour, whatever the case. They will come back to the Lord again and again, and they will seek after his ways. Why? Because they know their heart is wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We could consider all kinds of Old Testament heroes of the faith who fell into wickedness, who, who sinned greatly. But our author says, take care, brothers. Take care. Be intentional. Don't just take the weight off when the Lord meets with you and go, oh, that's so freeing, and then not make any adjustment. What adjustments do you need to make today in order to cultivate a deeper, richer faith with the Lord? What do you need to start saying no to that you haven't been saying no to? What do you recognize is a distraction that you give into time and time again because there's some form of comfort there? 
but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Take a look at 14. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. <laughs> as we read through this, it is incredibly humbling. And I think it's eye-opening in so many ways. And we have to stop and ask that question. How do the evidences of your life reflect where you stand with God? Verse 15 at the end of the chapter says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not allow distraction to set in. Do not leave from this place and not talk about, write down, or make a commitment to the type of adjustment that you need in order to find alignment with God. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he would not, they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. The reality is that we reject God's prompting, leading, guiding word in our life more often than we would ever admit. And there's a warning that comes with that. We see that just punishment comes to those who do not follow the Lord, who do not surrender to him as Lord of their life. And so how are we intentional about not letting ourselves slide into that? For the last two weeks, we've talked about five commitments of membership here at Grace Church. And one of them is that you would be committed to being here on Sunday morning for worship. Why? Because it's a way of putting up guardrails in your life to keep you on the right track. It's a way of coming back and finding alignment before the Lord every week. We talk about getting in life groups, getting in Bible studies, getting in prayer gatherings, being intentional about building relationships with other believers. Why? Because it is among other believers that you should be encouraged, that you should be prayed over, that you should be built up in the faith, and that you can come back and find alignment again and again. We want to grow in our faith, not just so that we can be right before the Lord, not just so that we can make it into heaven. The goal of your salvation is not for you to make it to heaven. The goal of your salvation is to have a right relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And when you have a right relationship with him, what he does is he purifies your soul from that wickedness that we've been talking about. That thing that lives in you and also lives in me. And so we are called to seek after him with all that we have, with all that we are. We, in Psalm 95, are are called to choose to be like Moses rather than the people who are following. I want to just finish this morning by reading Psalm 95, verses 1 to 7. It says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. I don't know where you're at with the Lord today, but know that you can take that weight off today. You can lay it before the throne and you can make the adjustments that you need to make to be in right relationship 
with him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this time where we can honestly evaluate ourselves before your throne. Lord, as David cried out to you, we pray, search our heart, O Lord. Know our ways. And if there be any wickedness in us, would you bring it to the forefront of our mind so that we can lay it at your throne, so that we can find alignment with you. Lord, we commit ourselves to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.